There we go. All right. It's always good when everything shows up on the right screen. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, same problem here. We can see a screen. Uh, okay, good. Welcome. <laughs> go ahead, please. Thank you. So um, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Siobhan Kelleher, and I am a senior security analyst, and I work in higher ed. Um, before I moved into higher ed, I had a pretty successful sales career, and I learned a lot about OSINT and social engineering while I was doing that. And I didn't realize that's what it was called at the time. Um, because you just use it to, you know, make sales. Um, when I moved into um, information security, I realized that I can use this not just for cases, but also for um, for fun and also for competing in CTFs and, and other things like that. So um, what I want to do is share with you some of the tools and resources that I use to get started with OSINT, specifically geared towards finding people. So while I was working in sales, I learned how to research my targets so that I could create curated sales pitches for them by incorporating things that were important to them. It's important to make that personal connection with the person you're trying to sell things to. So I found these things by using open source intelligence or OSINT to research the business and the key decision makers. I was looking for things like how much money did the company make last year? How many employees? What technology do they have? Um, and when I was researching the key decision makers, I was looking for ways to open a conversation and make a personal connection with them. So who were they? What did they like? What were they more likely to listen to from a pitch perspective? How could I connect to them? What were their favorite sports teams? Do they have pets? Did they have a hobby? Anything I could use to build that bridge with them to get to the sale. That was my job. Um, those skills translated really well into security, and I use them now um, to help find people. So if you're looking for someone who maybe sent a malicious email to one of your users or um, are looking to help educate users on, um, on their risks in, their, in your awareness training programs, OSINT can be really helpful as well. The term open source intelligence or OSINT describes a type of information and how it's used. Basically, it's any type of information available to the public, even if it's behind a paywall, that's used for intelligence research or recon. How that information is used can vary quite a bit. OSINT's used by journalists, it's used by intelligence professionals, red teamers and blue teamers use it, librarians, and so many more. It's an incredibly broad field. OSINT is an important component of any threat intelligence operation, so it's a really good skill to grow and a great um, technique to add to your security team skills. We all use open source intelligence every day from personal things like looking up a phone number, finding an address, checking to see if that ex from high school is still on Facebook. I'm kidding, don't use it to stalk people. Um, and to our jobs where I'll look up maybe a potentially malicious IP or a file hash. I might look up systems using Shodan or I might research APT behavior. The topic I'm gonna to cover today is just one small portion of how OSINT can actually be used. The skills, oops, I'm still on the same page. There we go. The skills we use to research threats in our environment are very similar to the skills used to find people. If you're like me and you enjoy looking for needles in haystacks, you may enjoy OSINT research. There is a vast amount of information available out there for people about people for free. Their likes, their dislikes, their habits, where they live, where they work, and more. Most of us in security are familiar with the idea of OPSEC or operational security and keeping our information secure from bad actors. The average user is not, and they often leave a wealth of information scattered all over the internet. As security professionals, we understand how bad actors use this information to attack users and their companies. So how am I using OSINT and how could you use OSINT? Some of the examples of how I use OSINT in my professional life are as part of user awareness training. I'm not gonna cover user awareness training too much in this talk, but it is really important to understand that anything that we can find, threat actors can also find. So open source information can be used to profile an employee and craft a very highly effective spear phishing campaign, or it could be used to attempt to breach their accounts. There is a scene in Mr. Robot, and if you haven't watched Mr. Robot yet, I highly recommend watching it, um, where Elliot, the main character, is trying to gain access to a target's account. He looks at their social media profile for words to use in a dictionary attack to crack the target's password. 
he's able to gain information like their favorite sports team, their address, their pet's name, and so on. Helping users understand how accessible their personal information is and how their personal information could be used maliciously helps protect not only their personal accounts, but also their business accounts. So I'm not saying you should run a full OSINT search on your end users, that's a bad idea, but having a discussion with them about the types of records that are out there and how they could be used is important. Um, additionally, there have been times where I've used OSINT in my job to track external malicious email or usernames. Personally, I like to use my knowledge of OSINT to help find missing people by participating in OSINT CTFs. I've also used it to assist in domestic abuse cases. The investigations are very similar. You wanna find what information is out there about your target or your victim. Generally, you're gonna look at things like public records, social media, and a general web search to see what's on major search engines. Occasionally, you might look at things like credential dumps, and as much of the internet's not accessible from a major search engine, you may wanna see what's available on the deep or the dark web. This is a very busy, but a very helpful infographic. Um, and the makers are listed in the bottom corner. Here they've broken down common types of OSINT by category. So social media, social images, internet searches, geodata, blogging, and so on. Sometimes when I get stuck, I will refer to this. When we're looking for people, we're focused on things that person might interact with. So for example, unless your target is a jet setter, you probably won't be looking at any aviation data. You're likely to start with a small amount of information about a person, like their name and where they live, or maybe just a username or an email address. For the most part, you wanna look at things like image searches, email, social media, and public records. These are the most common sources that I use when I'm looking for people. Once I was working on finding information for a missing child as part of a CTF, where I was able to pivot off the child's Facebook account to her sibling's account and get a lead on where she could potentially be. The way I did that was through a really simple Google search. I found the grandfather's obituary. Obituaries are a great resource and they often list the first and last name of all the family members, sometimes with their locations. I took those names and I searched them on social media until I found her sister's account. On her sister's account, there was a recent picture of her, her sister and a boy. By digging into the boy, I was able to find that she had recently been with him and I was able to submit that information to be included in the investigation package. Before we get too into the fun OSINT tools, we should talk about organization. The amount of data that's available is really vast and it can be very overwhelming. It's not uncommon for me to have upwards of 100 browser tabs open between different machines and it gets really difficult to remember where you are if you get lost or if you get interrupted. There are lots of tools available to help organize your investigations. Some of them are paid and some of them are free. I like to use free things whenever possible. Um, mind mapping is a really great tool to help keep you organized. There are tons of templates out there to help you get started and using them can be really helpful to remind you of what it is you need to look for next. Most commonly I use Excel and for long-term investigations, I may also use Trello or a similar tool to help track artifacts. It's important to take good notes on everything you find and how you found it. This helps when you go to hand off the data for the investigation. It's also a requirement for a CTF and generally it's just a good practice. Um, at a minimum, using a tabs manager like Session Buddy or something like that can be really helpful. And it allows you to save all your open tabs as a collection, which is really great if you have to get up and walk away from the investigation and come back to it later. So this is a mind map that I really like, and it's a really great tool anytime you have a large project to help keep you organized. But specifically, I like to use it for OSINT because you can put in links to everything that you're looking for. Um, this one here was created by a member of the OSINT community. It works with XMind, which does have a free version. Um, this map is really nice because it has links built into it and you can customize them based on what it is that you're looking for. But it'll help you remember to look for each item, like the usernames, the email addresses, and where to look so that you don't miss something or skip something that could gain you points. If mind mapping seems a little bit too intense to start with, Excel is a really simple option. This is an example of how I might lay out an Excel sheet for an investigation. I like to keep things really streamlined, really easy to see. The title with the name of the missing person at the top and a link to their missing persons poster or any additional information I might have. 
and then columns to track what I found, where I found it, and the evidence to support it. If I'm tracking a user from an email address or a username, then I just put that at the top instead of the missing persons poster. When I'm doing a longer investigation, I use Trello to organize my information. Inside each card, I can attach artifacts, or if they're of an extremely sensitive nature, I can make a note of where I've stored them. I can also capture notes inside the cards, which is really helpful. It's important to track your work for many reasons. The, the biggest reason is that it's helpful when you hand this off to investigation organizers. They need to have a clear understanding of what you're giving them and how you found it. So it can be included in the investigation package that will be handed over to authorities. If the information is for a CTF, you have to provide your evidence in order to get your points. And it doesn't matter if you're investing, investigating a missing person or a sender of a malicious email, if this is for your job or if it's for a CTF. In, in any case, they're going to want to know how you came to the conclusion. So always back up your work with evidence. Uh, and also never underestimate the usefulness of a good found notebook for jotting things down quickly. I always have an investigation notebook with me, regardless of whether or not I'm doing an investigation for work or an investigation for a CTF. It just helps keep things organized. Um, so tools. Maltigo is a really great resource to help you um, organize artifacts, but also find and link artifacts. They have a really great community edition um, for personal use that's free. Uh, it has built-in tools to harvest people-specific information, like networking activity, um, email addresses, phone numbers, and so on through an API. It does take some work to get it set up if you want to hook up the additional APIs, but it's not a lot of maintenance after you get it initially set up. You can input something like an email address and call with, and run what they call a transform on it, and it will return linked accounts like what you see in the um, picture here. Running transforms in Multigo will reveal your IP address, so it's important that you use a VPN when you're using this tool. The tool can save a lot of time, but it can also throw you down rabbit holes if you don't stay focused on what you're looking for. It does come pre-installed with Kali, and you do need to set up a Community Edition account to fully use the program. Sometimes Google is an easier way to go. And if you're familiar with Google dorking, um, it's a lot faster when you're trying to get exactly what you're looking for. Tools sometimes fail, so it's important to have that backup plan. For example, Maltigo's Twitter transform doesn't work right now, and I'm not sure if they're going to be able to bring it back up again. So if you wanted to get something from Twitter, you can do a Google dork. Say, for example, I wanted to look up malware. I would put into Google site twitter.com and then the in-text malware, and it will return every public tweet with the word malware in it. While you could just Google Twitter and the word malware, that's going to return everything that has to do with Twitter and malware. This dork will return just what's found on twitter.com as opposed to everywhere else. You can use this with any website. So you could use it with Facebook. You can use it with other social media sites. Anything that's publicly available, you can insert into where it says Twitter.com. So you could put Facebook.com and index malware, and it would do the same thing. So another resource that I use is the OSINT framework. This is a really good place to start if you're looking for um, resources and, and how, how to find websites to use for searches. Um, you can use it to look up all kinds of different artifacts. As you open the topics, you'll find links to websites. You can run searches on different types of things. People um, often use the same or similar usernames across multiple platforms. So this, re uh, this resource can really come in handy if you hit a dead end or just don't know where to start. And one of the missing children cases I worked as part of a CTF, their Facebook account was really locked down. So I couldn't see what they had posted and wasn't getting much off friends and family members. This is becoming increasingly more common with younger people as they move away from Facebook in favor of other social media sites. I was able to find their Instagram account by searching the username on Namecheck. It's a link off of the OSINT framework. Their Instagram account was public and more recently active, which led to a new list of friends and associations I was able to include in the investigation. There are also links to dark web search tools. If you're going to use these, you're going to need a Tor browser, and I strongly recommend you use a VPN. Um, as a Short side story, um, I was researching a case that involved revenge pornography a while back, and I started digging around on the dark web to see if I could find any additional accounts or images um, that had been posted by the bad actor. And through a series of links, I found myself, regrettably, in a very bad place. 
Um, so it's important to make sure you take notes just in case for any reason I ever had to explain why I ended up there. So I have, a, I pre-recorded my demos and I have a little video showing how to use the framework. Excellent. So Siobhan, can you explain what is happening here? You're drilling down uh, into the um, uh, tree uh, to look for someone uh, using username, right? Oh, sorry. Is there no, is there no audio? No, uh, we don't oh. hear the audio, unfortunately. <laughs> Probably you're not sharing it. Yeah, that's why. Okay, okay. You'll well, need to um, talk us through it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so what's happening here is when you go into um, how do I mute it so that I don't hear it? There we go. <laughs> All right, so when you go into the OSINT framework, there's lots of different options um, that you can click on that will give you different information. Um, let me just switch to live. Okay, so when you go into the OSINT framework, there's lots of different um, links here that will give you all kinds of different information. There's training information in the bottom. There's information about keeping yourself safe. If you look down, there's some um, dark web and um, some other information down here. I'm gonna show you usernames. So if you click in username, you can click into username search engines, and then you can click into any one of these. They're all pretty good. I just happen to be partial to name check. And then you can type in the username that you're looking for and then search it just like you would just a regular Google search. It takes a couple seconds to come back and then you'll get a list down here at the bottom of all the different accounts. So green is where the username is available so it's not being used. Um, the dimmed like paste bin, trip, Roblox you'll see here, those are unavailable which means that the username has been used there. If you're getting yellow back, then that means that that particular style of username is not available with that. So it's an invalid username for that. And then red just means that there's an error. It could be with this page or it could be with um, the other page. So it's really simple and easy to use. Okay. So Spiderfoot is another tool that I use. Um, it's really cool and it has quite a few capabilities. I'm gonna cover how I use it for investigations. There's two versions. There's a free, there's a free version that's web-based and then there's a downloadable open source version. I tend to use the web-based version because I'm using this when I'm doing um, CTFs and I'm not looking up a whole lot of different things and I don't need an extensive search. But if you want a long search or an extensive search or you're gonna be using it frequently, then it makes sense to, um, to use the open source downloadable version. There is a paid version as well, but unless you're gonna incorporate um, OSINT in this way into your, um, your security uh, platform, it doesn't necessarily make sense to pay for. The free version will get you everything that you need. So I come into Spiderfoot. When you can see that I've run scans before, if I wanna run a new scan, it's really simple. Um, I just hit the plus button over here. Before we run the new scan, I'll give you a quick run through. With the free version, you can't use the investigate or the monitor and it does have a lot of limitations, but if you're just using it for a CTF or you're just using it to find a malicious email or something like that, then it doesn't need, you don't need all the extra things necessarily. So I'm gonna call this one test and you put in your scan target. Um, down here, you can change your, your iterations. You can add and remove modules. If you were going to scan a corporate target using this, you may want to pay attention to 
the items that are loud and would set off alarms on their end. And then there's options down here um, for um, getting an email when it's done or running correlations. You'll see on the right here that I don't have any APIs configured. It's because I don't pay for the program, so I can't configure APIs. Um, if you use the open source or you pay, then you can configure APIs. And then over here, you'll see that you get three scans a month. You get one target per scan. Um, and there is a limit for how long the scan will run. So to run the scan, I just hit run now. It's pretty, pretty simple. You'll get a notification that the scan is successfully started. And then you'll get the spinning notification up here on the right hand side that the scan has started. It'll start to come back and populate information down here. So I've run this scan before, so we can go back to the scan section and open it. So this is a, um, a SOC account that I don't use too much, so it doesn't come up with a whole lot of things that it's found it in. But there's a couple different things that I want to highlight. And one of them is the node graph. If you're doing an investigation that's going to result in some kind of a presentation or um, you need to hand something off to someone, this is a really nice graphic to include. It kind of shows you the account and then everywhere else that it was found, which is really nice. You can click into these and it will open up more information about where it's founded. And you can do the same with the, um, the graphs on the first page. It is important to note that just because it found an account with the same username does not mean that this account belongs to the person that we're looking for. So you'll want to remember that you need to look into um, the account and kind of use a little bit of your investigation knowledge to determine whether or not the account looks like it belongs to the person that you're looking for or if it might not be theirs. And that's just kind of a gut feeling sometimes. You can't really get a solid answer on that. And sometimes you can get a very solid answer. You can link it back to other accounts as well. OK. So now you have um, breached passwords from running your uh, spider foot scans, hopefully. And where can you go to get the passwords for the breached account? There's lots of different places you can go. There's lots of places in the dark web you can go to get um, breached passwords. There's a couple places um, on, the, you know, on the normal web where you can go. My favorite resource is the Scylla project. This is run by a researcher that I know, and he's put together the page. It's free to use. It doesn't require an account. You can hook it through an API if you want to, so you can query it that way instead of accessing the page directly. Um, his goal is to make the sale of breach data obsolete by posting it as quickly as he can. So it kind of takes the power away from, from the bad actors, hopefully. Um, and this data can be really helpful for investigators to have. It is important to mention, though, once you have a username and a password, that doesn't mean you should go log into the account. You should put it aside and make sure you hand it off to the investigators who are going to take the case over from you. Uh, for reverse image searching, there's lots of different tools you can use. I tend to use Tenai because if you use Google Images, you get a really broad set of results back. Um, for example, if you search a picture of something that's round and yellow, you'll get everything that ever existed that was round and yellow, whereas Tenai, you might get a more specific answer back. Um, and I typically use reverse image searches where and I don't know where to start if I'm striking out everywhere um, or if I've finished the end of my investigation, things are starting to really run cold and I want to see if I can just get a few more things. Um, some of the things to think about is pictures on people's social media sites. You can run those to see if someone else has the same picture on their site to link accounts together. Um, pictures from the missing person poster, you can try running those as well. Those sometimes are taken by family members and exist on their social media sites. So when you search them, those will come back sometimes. So sometimes what we're looking for is really easy to find and tools like Spiderfoot and Maltigo are overkill. 
More often than not, I start out with a really simple Google search looking for Facebook accounts or Twitter accounts or anything else I can get with the person's name on it and their hometown or just their email address. And then from there, I dig into their social media accounts by logging into one of my SOC accounts. And I am gonna talk about SOC accounts in just a moment. So an example of this is one of my end users received a very inappropriate email with racist and threatening content personally directed at them and their family. The person sending the email used a Proton account, which is commonly done when someone wants to hide who they are. Fortunately for me and unfortunately for them, they used the same username on another account that had just enough information to track it back to them. I was able to use a username search site to track down their other accounts. I found their blog. From their blog, they had linked their Facebook page. And on their Facebook page, I was able to find their name, their address, and then link it to additional accounts with similar racist messages. So I had a really nice package when I handed that off to the police. Following OPSEC is really important when you are doing OSINT work, when you're finding people. Because of the nature of the sites you will use, like Facebook and Twitter, if you use your personal account, it will show that information to the person that you're looking at. So you don't want your personal account to be exposed to potentially bad actors. We don't know who the people are. We don't know why they've gone missing. They could have been abducted. They could be in abusive situations. We don't know. Um, and you don't want that situation coming back to your personal life. In the case of the malicious email, I already know that this person is unstable and I do not want them coming after me and my family. Uh, and additionally, we don't want to taint any of the investigation. We don't want Google using our algorithms and our searches. We don't want um, our social media stuff messing with what we're looking at. Generally, as a good rule, I like to think of it as a crime scene. And you wouldn't walk through the middle of a physical crime scene. So don't walk through the middle of a digital investigation. When you're finding a person, it's important to remember that you're not trying to own accounts. We're trying to find information about where someone is or who's behind a user account. These types of investigations are commonly referred to as passive recon or no touch. They're not invasive, meaning you don't attempt to interact with the target, their friends, or their family. We don't use any illegal hacking techniques and we do not try to log into accounts. The reason that we do this is because if you're looking for a missing person or a malicious actor, it could be upsetting to the family or it could bring that malicious actor, um, you to the attention of the malicious actor. Adversaries are obviously going to use illegal techniques because their goal is to gain access to systems and accounts. So it's important that we understand both, but it's also important that we don't use any illegal techniques when we're doing this. So two things I would strongly recommend to keep yourself safe while doing an investigation is using a VM and using a VPN. I don't recommend using your work VPN you can roll your own VPN if you want. I use Proton, and I know a few researchers that use Brave and Nord and PIA. Um, it is best practice to attempt to connect from the area that the target is in, but sometimes that's not possible because the connection in that area doesn't allow social media sites. In this case, you could use a proxy or you could connect from another location. It's highly unlikely that you're going to be tracked back, but it is a best practice not to mix your personal connection with an investigation. It is also a best practice to use a dedicated machine that you do not use for your personal or work use when you're doing this. This I found can create a barrier for many, including myself. When competing in a CTF, I've always just used a really well isolated VM because an extra machine is just out of reach for me. But when I do use OSINT for work, I do have a separate investigation machine that I use for that. Using a VM, helps ensure that your personal social media information and browser information is not gonna spill into your investigation. If you are gonna be doing any work in the dark web um, or with Tor, it is strongly recommended that you use a separate machine from anything that you would be using for work or for personal use and not just a VM. It's very important to protect your personal identity by not using any personal social media accounts to search for people. As I said before, we don't know what their situation is and we don't want any of that blowing back into our personal lives. A sock puppet account is a fake identity that you can use for recon. I strongly recommend create, creating sock puppets when investigating social media accounts instead of using your own. So how do you create a sock puppet safely? When you create a sock puppet, also commonly referred to as a SOC, you should be doing so from an isolated system like a VM 
um, ideally behind a VPN. That can create some challenges because some social media sites like Facebook don't allow that. There are a couple ways around it. One is a burner cell for verification. Um, a burner cell is a cell that you'll throw away and a number that does not register back to you. I've heard that Mint Mobile is a really great um, source for burner cells. You can also use a proxy service that tricks Facebook into thinking you have a residential IP. And in the past, I've actually used open public Wi-Fi to set up stock accounts. Don't do this from your work and don't do this from your home um, unless you absolutely are stuck and it's just for a CTF. If you're doing this for an actual investigation, you wanna make sure it doesn't track back to you. When you're making a SOC, unless you're doing a long-term uh, investigation that involves a lot of recon, you don't need to put a lot of effort into your SOC. Um, you'll need to generate a name and a picture for your profile. Uh, this person does not exist is a great site to snag a fake picture from, but you will want to edit it just a little bit because all of them have the same L. And if someone's looking for a SOC, they'll notice it right away. You can also use a fake name generator or just something that doesn't tie back to you. Keeping your socks alive and organized can be a challenge. I keep my socks organized in an Excel spreadsheet, but I've heard a lot of people are using CRMs as well. Um, you wanna log into them from time to time to post on them and keep them alive. I use my burner phone to access my sock accounts and you should never log into your accounts on your devices. They should always be kept separate. You also should not friend your socks. Your socks should not be friends with each other. You should not be friends with your socks. Your socks generally shouldn't be friends with people that you actually know. And if you log into your personal account on your burner cell, it's no longer your burner cell. You've now made that obsolete, so you need to change it again. When you create your SOC, uh, you wanna follow some obvious accounts and groups, political accounts, actors, sports professionals are really great choices and they're usually select, uh, suggested by the platforms as soon as you log in. And when you're creating the account, kind of think about the types of targets that you're gonna be going after. So if I am gonna be targeting, looking for missing children, then I'm gonna use a SOC that's gonna have that kind of an age range. So maybe a 16 or a 17 year old um kid if i'm looking for an adult then maybe i would have you know a 40 or a 50 year old adult picture with an adult profile and so the accounts that you follow should also kind of jive with that as well like if i'm a 19 year old person i might follow bts but maybe not so much if i'm a 60 year old male So one of the ways I use my OSINT skills is by competing in Trace Labs Capture the Flag events. Um, there are certainly people out there who do this for a living and are much better at this than I am, but I found this to be something that brings me a lot of joy during COVID. Uh, it gives me a way to spend time with my friends in a safe and healthy way and know that the time that I'm putting you know, aside to do this is actually really making an impact and really helping somebody. And I think um, that's one of the greatest things that I've done so far this year for my own uh, self-care is to compete in the Trace Lab CTFs. It is a um, challenging topic, especially as myself, I'm a mother, to see people missing their children, but it is comforting to know that at least I tried to help. And Trace Labs puts together really, really great events and their sense of community is incredibly helpful. They also have ongoing monthly investigations that you can assist with if you want to. So um, it's really easy to get started with OSINT. If you can Google, you can do this. Um, all you need are the things to keep you safe, like a VM or a separate machine, a VPN, and the desire to literally search for virtual needles in a haystack. Some days it takes me hours to find just one little thing. <laughs> um, while I've been researching people, companies, and other entities using OSINT for years, I only got into searching for people at the Layer 8 conference in Rhode Island, um, that's in the States and Providence, about two years ago. Um, and since then, I've competed in several CTFs and consulted on cases related to domestic violence and revenge pornography. 
none of it's terribly complicated and it's a really good skill to grow and it translates really well into the day job if you wanna start using OSINT as part of your security program. The most difficult part of this is staying organized. And if you use some of the tools and tips that I've outlined, it should help you stay organized throughout your investigations. I think I finished a little bit ahead of time, um, but I, uh, if anybody has any questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Siobhan. It's been an absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, and uh, even for me, I discovered uh, a lot of very interesting things that I didn't know about before. Uh, so just a reminder to everyone uh, to ask questions using the uh, YouTube uh, question uh, chat facility. You can also ask questions using slide.do slash OWASP website. So while we are getting questions there, I actually have a few questions myself, Siobhan, if you don't mind. So. Um, <laughs> First question I have for you is the question on the um, image search. You mentioned the um, uh, uh, TNI uh, rather than Google Images to, to search for an image. One interesting thing I know about OSINT uh, that sometimes people post OSINT challenges on Twitter where they mm -hmm. show a picture of a place and basically saying, where is this? What kind of tool do you use to identify a location based on a picture? So I am not awesome at identifying locations based on picture, but I look at it the same way that I look at finding a person. I kind of try and look at what's in the picture and then go from there. Um, you can throw the picture through Google search and sometimes that'll come right back and give you where it is. You can also throw it through TinEye and see what happens and sometimes it'll come right back. There are lots of resources for this and it's a skill that I've actually in the past two months started working on. Um, but what I do when I look at an image like that is look for things that might tip me off. Street signs, in unique cars, unique pictures, unique images that are in there that I can search on. So if I see you know, a red fire hydrant with a silver top, I might start with that. If I know that it's in the United States and I know it's a red fire hydrant and I know it's a silver top, that's gonna limit me down to you know, some, some things. <laughs> Okay, they, uh, thank you. The next question I have is about um, uh, Sock Puppet accounts. So uh, mm -hmm. one of the things to have, because you described the whole ecosystem of having multiple Sock Puppet accounts, which are yeah. all friends with each other on social networks, but are never friends with yourself. Uh, but one of the question I have is about verification, because I believe uh, most um, uh, social networks will require phone verification. Do you then recommend recommend to actually ha have a burner phone, an individual number for every sing single Sock Puppet account? So no, I use the same burner for, uh, for all of my sock accounts. Um, so there is that weakness. If you were doing this professionally, I'm sure someone would say, don't do that. Um, but they're gonna have more resources than I am. Um, so I use the same burner for, for all of my socks. And I have you know a couple of Facebook, a couple of Twitter, a couple of LinkedIn, um, and a couple of other ones as well. But I don't have a tremendously large platform of them. But uh, people who do this for a living, they do, they have a, a much larger platform and they do use individual, um, individual phone numbers. You can use a Google number for some of them, but some of them it kicks it back too. So it, the mid mobile tends to be the easiest interesting. way. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, because uh, I remember so, some problem with Google voice numbers occasionally, yeah. they don't uh, take SMS messages from uh, some networks. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. I have uh, two more questions, uh, fascinating talk. So you mentioned uh, after you finished uh, using your VM, when you mm -hmm. investigate using the VM, uh, as opposed to using a physical machine, uh, you recommend to burn the VM. Uh, but do you basically re recommend to burn the VM, but keep the notes? Is that right? So it, why, yeah. why do you keep the notes, right? Is it for further investigation by police or any other inquiries? Yep. Yeah, it's really easy to burn a VM and restand it back up again. So just out of precaution, I do it. Um, and um, I do keep the notes uh, all separate. When I'm taking notes for something, it's usually um, in Trello or it's in Excel or it's in my notebook. And you always wanna make sure you keep your notes for your investigation. Now, if I'm doing a CTF, I may not hold the notes for very long because they're not really gonna come back and ask you like, where did you find this information? Um, because you've provided that. But if I'm handing it over for work and I'm doing an investigation where I'm handing it to the police, I always keep my notes um, for a couple of years, just in case I have to go to court 
and testify. I want to make sure that I've, I've got the information and I can refresh my mind on it. And that's, that's pretty much any investigation you would do. You want to keep your notes on. Um, okay. I have one more question. I think we have uh, questions coming in on YouTube as well. So when uh, talking about this person does not exist.com, you mentioned mm -hmm. about something about images that create, uh, that it creates and that some adjustments need to be made. Can you please yep. elaborate what adjustments need to be made to that picture? So I would maybe change the eyes um, or, you know, put them in a different background because they all kind of have this dead stare. Um, if you're investigating again, if you're investigating a real quick investigation, something like a malicious email or um, you're, you're doing a CTF, you may not need to put that much effort into it. But if you don't want your, your SOC account to get shut down, those are things that I recommend because they do, they will shut them down if, if they look like SOCs and those, those, um, pictures tend to look like socks. Okay, thanks. So I believe we have some questions coming in from YouTube. Andra, would you be able to read out the questions from YouTube, please? Sure. Um, okay, so the first one is, what is the best way to keep private and protect our identities from tools like Multigo? Using a VPN um, yeah. and running it from a VM would be, that, I mean, that's what I do. If you're using a VPN, um, for the most part, you're protecting your identity. Perfect, thank you. And the second one is um, from Grayson, actually. Would you be able to elaborate more on what a CTF is like? Yeah, um, so everybody's CTF experience is a little bit different. Mine, I usually balance through like taking care of my child. So it's, it's usually really interesting. Um, I have never had a, ne a negative experience in a CTF. When I do the Trace Lab CTFs, um, you log in and there is a list of accounts that you can go after and they give you the, the missing person and you take that information and you submit um, things like, you know, if you find their home address, if you find their mother, if you find their father, if you find phone numbers, if you find um, other social media accounts, usernames, passwords, locations, the goal is to find the person as fast as, fast as you can is close to where they actually are. So if you have a post within the last week that shows that they're still alive, they, they wanna see that stuff. And that's where you're gonna get your biggest points. Um, but don't pass up the little stuff either because the, the, you know, the mother's name, the phone numbers and things like that, the, the little points all add up as well. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, yeah. Um, and something very technical, um, a, a question that just turned up. When you burn a VM, do you overwrite the VM files or is it enough to revert to a prior snapshot? I overwrite them. Uh, it's probably enough to refer to a snapshot, but I'm super paranoid. So. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Sam? Um, yes, uh, thanks, Siobhan. So we actually have even more questions coming in. So uh, <laughs> I pasted some of them in chat for you as well, Siobhan. So, um, uh, one of the question is, uh, what paid for apps and services can you not do without in your OSINT work? So any paid for apps that you use? Um, so I do pay for, um, for VMware, uh, VM Fusion, as opposed to using VirtualBox. Um, it just, it's a matter of preference. I know a lot of people who use VirtualBox and they love it. For me, I like VM Fusion. It's just easier for me to work with. Um, and I do pay for that. Um, Oh, oh, well, and my, my, um, my burner, I do pay for the burner. Uh, okay. And that's pretty much it. Everything else I use is free. <laughs> Excellent. We have one more question. Uh, are there any tools for finding deleted resources, such as deleted social media posts and other Ooh, deleted yes. things? That's a very good question. Um, and I cut it because I thought I was going to be over time. Um, yes, uh, you can use the Internet Archive, which is literally one of my favorite projects. They, they, they um, scan and save websites from years and years and years ago. So if you have like a favorite message board that you're really missing, you can go and look at it. Um, or if you're looking for an account that's been deleted, you can go and look at that account. Um, also Google Cache is really helpful. Um, I used that just recently. I was looking for, for someone and they had deleted their Twitter account from the time that I was alerted to the problem to the time that I went to investigate it, it was gone. Um, but thankfully, Google Cache had a full, um, 
a full backup of everything that was on their account, every post that had been made, every picture that had been posted, it was still all right there and it was super easy. And the way you do that is you Google something, it'll come back with a result. And then there's a little drop down to the right hand side and you hit that and say cash and it'll give you the cached version of the site, which is super helpful. <laughs> Wonderful. We actually have the next question, which is exactly on the opposite. It's basically, um, uh, are there any effective strategies for people to remove any mentions or records from search engines? And how do you find this kind of tools to remove yourself? So that's complicated. There are lots of um, companies that you can pay that will go through and find all of your presence on the internet and you can have them remove your presence on the internet. Um, it depends on where you are too and what the laws are surrounding it. Um, I know um, the, if some of the data with the EU and, and GDPR, but generally speaking, my experience has been that I have to physically write them a letter and ask them to remove my information. And even then sometimes it still is still there. Um, the biggest thing you'll have success with is images um, because there's a lot of laws around images. If you ask someone to take your image off of something, they have to. Um, in most cases, but it's once it's out there, it's pretty much out there. Yeah, it's not easy to uh, disappear from the internet. Uh, we no. have uh, another question um, about trace labs. How often are trainings to prepare for trace lab CTFs? And is there a link? How do, how do you pre prepare for a CTF? Oh, um, so there are trainings that are provided by multiple different people uh, for competing in the CTFs. Um, oh, somebody just did one that was really good. Al Alfie Dennis does a real, and I probably butchered her name, um, does a really wonderful training specifically around competing in the Trace Lab CTFs. Um, and I believe that those are still running. Um, Trace Labs offers some training as well. Um, they usually run them at the same time that they're doing the CTFs, which there tends to be one about every month or so. Um, but I would say if you're comfortable with Google and you can use an Excel spreadsheet, jump in there, try it. You're not losing anything. It's like $10 to do a CTF. Wonderful. Uh, there's also a question about the tool. There's a question, how to protect yourself from tools like Full Story? I'm actually not familiar with the tool. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the tool myself as well. No. <laughs> um, we have one more question, uh, which is basically, how do you use Facebook for research or for CTF? So there's two ways to do it. Um, some posts are available publicly and you can use a Google Dork um, to find what you're looking for and you'll, you'll get it that way. Other posts are going to be private. So you've got to create an account and actually log in and look at it. I do not friend any of the people to be able to see what's on the account if they have their account set to private. I just back away and go somewhere else um, because most of the time I'm competing in a CTF and I'm looking for a child and I do not want to upset that family. Um, I have in the past when I was looking for a malicious actor tried to find an account to see if I could get more information off of the account, but it's also risky doing that. Um, so my advice, unless you're comfortable in this would be to just use what you can using your sock accounts and view what you can using your sock accounts, but don't try and friend anybody or, or, um, or reach out to them or contact them. Okay, uh, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Siobhan. I think it's been a fascinating talk.